Thursday, December 10th, and this is a post-market review for the stock market activities today. We have the big IPO behind us, and it was ridiculous, absolute mania, doubling the initial IPO price due to the massive stampede from retail investors to buy the Airbnb IPO. The stock pretty much closed flat from the starting price and we will see what happens here but I can only imagine what it's like to be an Airbnb insider waiting to dump and become filthy filthy rich and you're gonna dump before year end because you want to lock in the low tax rate. So we're about to see a lot of bag holders in this name, but the action overall today in the market was indicative to what's wrong in investing in 2020. The new generation of investors are accustomed to that when anything drops, even if it's a slight drop, every dip is worth buying. And you saw that happens right away today. And the valuations don't matter. Fundamentals don't matter. Nothing matters except FOMO and the fact that the guy or gal next to you is willing to pay more than the price that you have paid for today. It is a very problematic investing mentality. It is very dangerous because the problem is that a lot of these investors are aware of the valuation problem and the overextension, etc. But they're willing to participate in it for the FOMO purposes only. Meaning that we have this entire market with the short-termism mentality, willing to buy at hot prices to dump in the short term right away, which makes it very, very dangerous market and uninvestable market until and unless we see at least a 10 to 20% market correction. What we also saw today is a different market behavior than yesterday. As soon as Airbnb shares started trading in the market, you did see slight sell-off in the queues, some of the hotter names, but it was nowhere in comparison to what happened yesterday. So the question is, is that all there is? Meaning that yesterday we saw a sell-off to raise all of this cash that went into DoorDash, and Airbnb. And now we resume what we have been doing all along, marching higher and higher. We're going to try to answer the question via looking at the charts and understand what are the psychological incentives for market participants at this point of the year in the market. With that being said, we do have a market to cover. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down 69.55 points or a decline of zero. 0.23%. The Nasdaq closing in the green, 66.86 points or a gain of 0.54%. The S&P 500 slightly in the red, down 4.72 points or a decline of 0.13%. And here are the sector's performances for the day. Leading the way and capturing the gold medal by far, we see a rebound in energy. Crude oil futures climbing way higher today and you see energy stocks responding right away. For the second place and the silver medal, basic materials. Meanwhile, the third place and the bronze goes to consumer cyclicals. The laggards of the day led by industrials, real estate and consumer defensives. Moving on to the futures market and it was a sea of green with very few exceptions. Right away, massive day for crude oil. We see the WTI almost closing at 47. And when we move on to softs, we see a rebound in coca resuming the rally once again. We had the news about the elections in Ghana yesterday, and perhaps coca futures will continue to climb higher from this point on. Cotton, Kofi, Lombard, all closing in the green. With the biggest gainer of the day, Lombard over 4% gains for the day, creeping in and closing close to 800. The losers of the day in softs, OJ down over 3.5% and sugar down over 2% for the session. What's going on with metals? Gold muted, closing very slightly in the green. Similar story with silver, but we do see rebound for platinum, copper, Palladium, all closing about 2% or so for the day. What's going on here with meats? The opposite image of yesterday. We see live cattle, feeder cattle, closing slightly in the green. However, lean hogs giving up the majority of their gains 
from yesterday. What about grains? We see muted picture across the board, declines and gains of about half a percentage points or so. However, the notable winners for the day, wheat up over two and a half percent, and you guessed it, oats, another green day, closing about one and a half percent in the green. Moving on to the big casino. What's going on in the options market? The tables were not as hot as yesterday. We saw that the volume is starting to dry out, not just in the options market, but in the stock market as a whole. However, we do have the hottest tables for the day. Number one, Apple, with about 1,250,000 contracts traded for the day, and about 68% of those were calls. Tesla, number two, almost 1 million contracts for the day, 60% of those are calls. Palantir, number three, about 500,000 contracts for the day, with 70% going for calls and here are some interesting trades for the day we don't have a lot of interesting trades meaning significant ones today was the theme pretty much gambling with small amounts 10 cents here 25 cents there we didn't see major commitment of any of the trade very few of them were significant for the day Right away, we see the most unusual trades in the options market today for the ticker NET N -E -T. And they're buying the 90 calls expiration date New Year's Eve with expectation that the name will climb over 7% by then. And this is a very expensive trade costing about 5 million bucks. He was another one for the semiconductor name NXPI. And they're buying the 150 puts expiration date December 18th, meaning next week. We're starting to see some weakness in chips. So the trader right here is betting on further weakness in the sector, specifically for NXPI. Expecting that the name will decline over 5% by the end of next week. And this is a very expensive trade costing over 1 million bucks. And here is more bullish activities for Snapchat, the ticker SNAP. And they're buying the 56 calls expiration date next week with expectation that Snapchat will climb over 5% by then. Again, it is a very expensive trade costing about 1 million bucks. Oh, and by the way, we have a question from a viewer saying, how do you know which part of these trades is a single trade meaning a single trader making the bet you can see that from the cboe live vol application the platform shows you the real time when the trade takes place these are very unusual activities meaning that you have very small open interest to begin with in the particular trade and all of a sudden you see a surge of volume, the bulk and the majority of that volume is for a single trade. And then once the trade is out and about, traders follow the particular trade and you see volume being added to it. But the majority of these trades are done by single traders. And we see more bearish activities here for General Motors, buying the 38 puts expiration date January 15th with expectation that the name will decline over 11% by then. I do agree that General Motors is too extended right now and it is time for a break. Here was a wild shot for the IWM buying the 202 calls expiration date next week with expectation that the IWM will add more than 5.5% gains by then. This is a mania trade of course, the IWM is already overextended but the trader is taking a wild shot here to make a quick buck. We see another interesting trade here for the XLF, the ETF for financials. They're buying the 27 puts, expiration date, Christmas Eve, and they're paying over half a million bucks for this one alone. Of course, for the trade to be profitable, they need the XLF, the financial ETF, to decline over 6% by then. Of course, as you're looking at this table, you're seeing more and more activities for the ticker NET. We covered the most important one, so we're not going to go over the rest of them. But take note that there is a lot of unusual activities for this particular name. And we also see more activities for AMD. A lot of these options expired worthless last week, the bullish bits for AMD. But they're trying and giving it another shot. Buying the 102 calls expiration date. New Year's Eve and again this is a very expensive trade costing over half a million bucks and here is uh, the last one very interesting one for Bank of America the ticker BAC that goes hand in hand with the bearish bet for the XLF 
And they're buying the 26 and a half puts expiration date Christmas Eve with expectation the Bank of America would decline over 9% by then. And they're paying over quarter of a million bucks for this trade alone. Now, banks have been rallying due to the rise in yields. So are these traders betting on a decline for yields? What would be the catalyst for that? Is it a fallout? In stimulus talks, we start to read the tea leaves here. Moving on to the headlines that shaped the day. And right away, we heard about the tensions between the U.S. and China eating up. We banned some of their companies from being traded in U.S. exchanges. We slapped sanctions on some of their politicians. Now China is hitting back, slapping sanctions on U.S. lawmakers requiring visas even for U.S. diplomats. Now... I'm old enough to remember that news like this would rattle the market back during the heat of the US-China trade war. Today, in this video game market, these news mean nothing. Good news is good news, bad news is good news, worse news is even better news. And the reason for that, of course, is the continuous flow of cocaine, aka liquidity, in the market. And we heard from the ECB, the European Central Bank, supplying another round of cocaine to the market to the tune of over 500 billion euros, bringing the total of the bond buying program from the ECB to over 2.2 trillion bucks so far. Now, European traders and European markets were not happy with this new round of cocaine because they thought that 500 billion euros is not enough. And we saw European markets starting to slide lower. However, as soon as the US market started trading, and to illustrate the zombie mentality with American traders, we looked at this news and we said, oh, that is good news because we saw a new round of European Coke supply. That means that our own Fed will be motivated to supply the market with another round of cocaine. Even though we had bad news in the morning, horrible news, stunningly horrible. Here it is. The weekly jobless unemployment claims came at 853,000 versus 730,000 expected, meaning that we surpassed expectations by 100,000. A picture of unemployment is getting worse. And remember, we are a consumer-based economy. All of this weakness in unemployment means weakness in consumption. Meanwhile, stock prices in a different la-la land. They're not connected to what's going on in reality. But that will show up in corporate earnings sooner or later. Now, I had complaints from some viewers yesterday saying that I'm very negative, I'm an alarmist, and I should start looking at the bright side and the half full cup. Tell me how the hell I can be positive reading this news. How can I sugarcoat this one for you? The only way I can do it is by saying, oh, good news, good news, bad news, good news, worse news, even better news because of the cocaine. If that is your investment thesis, good luck, bro. I like to invest based on that uh, boring old technique called corporate earnings. I'm not a cocaine-based investor. But if you want me to be positive and give you some good news, I'm very capable of that. Here it is. Taylor Swift is releasing her newest album tonight, Midnight Eastern. I cannot wait. I've been refreshing the page over and over and over again. So there you go. Here is positive news for you so you don't get mad. However, back to the unemployment news. I cannot shake it off. Moving on to the stimulus news. What's going on here? Here it is. Mnuchin says progress has been made in forging a COVID-19 relief deal after he held talks with Republican and Democratic senators Wednesday night. This is yesterday. So do we have a bill today? Not really, because here is Nancy Pelosi saying that she's open to continue the stimulus negotiations after Christmas. Meanwhile, people are suffering right now, right here. They keep delaying and delaying, talking about talking about talking about talking about the stimulus deal. All of that just to give the stock market any hope to hold on to because God forbid the stock market has a red day. Moving on to space assholes. Billionaires Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. 
the two richest men in the planet. You know all of that supply of the cocaine from central banks? That somehow finds its way to land in the pockets of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, getting richer by fake money. And the space assholes, of course, are not concerned by any problems on this planet. They'd rather solve the outer space problems and serve their egos. And now we see that Jeff Bezos is giving Elon Musk a tap on the back, congratulating him for the rocket crash yesterday from SpaceX. And here's my take. If the space assholes want to use their wealth for space exploration and uh, aliens and Mars, just to serve their egos and the nerdy, curiosity they had since they were kids. I got no problem with that. However, their wealth is not being used to serve this planet. So why not tax the hell out of them? And then whatever left over money, they can use it to do whatever space exploration they want. Oh, and by the way, speaking of the space assholes and how they care about this planet, remember that the Tesla culties were rushed to defend Tesla when you attack Elon Musk by saying that Tesla and Reverend Elon are saving planet Earth. And here they are, they're saving planet Earth by chopping a lot of trees in the forest. Add to that all the child slavery labor in the Congo, the mine for cobalt. Oh, but fossil fuel and energy companies are the devil here. Elon and Tesla are just busy saving planet Earth. And we have more corporate news for you here. Hyundai bought Boston Dynamics, you know, for the famous robot. And the price tag is 921 million bucks. I don't know what the Boston Dynamics folks were thinking. Just take a look at what happened with the mania for Airbnb IPO today. The folks at Boston Dynamics could have just IPO'd themselves in the market and the Robin Hoodies and the Maniacs would have pushed that valuation from 921 million into 100 billion bucks. And here is more exciting news for you. Not really, but Samsung is releasing the new phone Galaxy S21 in January. Are you excited or not? Because the last one, the S20, was garbage. Complete garbage, no difference whatsoever, no notable upgrades whatsoever. And the S10 Plus remains the phone of the decade. I have the S10 Plus and I have no plans of upgrading my phone. It has everything I need. Cameras, good screen. Oh, and a headphone jack. Remember those? They don't make them like this anymore. The newer phones are pure garbage. I will hold into my S10 Plus until it blows up. And here's the last bit of news I want to share with you. This is, of course, what the Robin Hoodies achieved with the Stampede for the DoorDash IPO and the Airbnb IPO. SoftBank Vision Fund turned $680 million DoorDash investment into $11.5 billion bucks based on Wednesday's opening price. Remember that SoftBank, aka the devil, lost over 3 billion bucks gambling on call options, which they admitted that they will let those options expire worthless coming December 18th. That was the expiration date for all of their gambling activities. But Masa's son, of course, laughing because the Robin Hoodiets compensated him for his losses from the options gambling operation and then some stupidity from the Robin Hoodies is a bliss to the rich and corporate insiders. The largest transfer of wealth ever and the Robin Hoodies will be left holding the bag because they bought a bunch of lottery tickets. They don't realize it yet because we have not reached the drawing date yet. Moving on to the heat map analysis. What do we see here? All in all, it is a negative picture for the market. However, we see pockets of strength here, specifically in the energy sector. So let's go one by one, starting with the technology sector. The weakness in Microsoft continue is not actually weakness, but it is muted. It's been dormant doing absolutely nothing. You see Microsoft down over half a percent today. Meanwhile, Apple resuming the rally, closing slightly above 1% or so. We see a slight rebound here for chips, namely AMD rebounding about 2% or so to the upside. However, we see TSM and TC, Nvidia all muted for the day. We also saw a rebound in some of the hottest names that were downgraded yesterday 
And this is an illustration of how dangerous the market mentality is right now. Any dip, even though you have analysts coming out saying that, hey, these names are severely overvalued and you're going to have a 100% chance of loss if you buy them right now, forget it. The Robin Hoodies are going to buy the dip anyways. Because remember, what is the Robin Hoodies constitution? Number one, stocks only go up. Number two, there are no red days. And if there are red days, there are opportunity to buy. And we see Square closing in the green, about 5% or so. Okta rebounding, closing over 6.5%. CrowdStrike rebounding, closing over 8% for the day. Shopify, about 3% in the green. Trade Desk, closing over 3.5%. Datadog, over 6% in the green. And again, the reason why this is a dangerous behavior, because it gives validation to the Robin Hoodie theory and this is going to continue to work until one day it doesn't and you realize that you are holding the bag very dangerous mentality going on in the market right now what about communication services what do we see here google facebook muted we see at&t being dumped remember they pumped it we saw the activities in the options market now they're dumping it AT&T down about 2.5% for the day. What's working in communication services? The names that are rebounding from yesterday. You see Zoom closing in the green above 3% or so. Similar story for Spotify and Snapchat rebounding, closing over 8%. Again, they saw a mini dip. They stampede right away to buy it and push these names higher. What about video games? Muted for the day. However, we saw... Some unusual activities here in terms of relative volume for Activision Blizzard. So perhaps there's a big move coming for this particular name. Moving on to consumer cyclicals, the big name of Amazon, the big box, is muted. Similar story with big tech, the rest of big tech, the fang names. Exception, of course, Netflix. But we see Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook all being muted, doing nothing for weeks and weeks right now what's going on with automotives we see tesla rebounding about 3.7 percent gains for toyota over one and a half percent but we see red picture here for general motors ford honda and it's a rebound day for neo as well closing over two and a half percent in the green casinos mixed picture las vegas sands down over one percent however mgm grand closing in the green over 3.3 percent for the day peloton rebounding closing in the green six and a half percent you see the scrap picking theme in the market today hotels slightly rebounding we see marriott closing one percent in the green lululemon in apparel closing one and a half percent in the green however they reported earnings after the bell last time i checked the name is declining just slightly the winner of the day here in consumer cyclicals is starbucks closing above four percent matter of fact almost five percent for the day and reaching all times highs what about consumer defensives the weakness for dollar general dollar tree continues we see walmart costco target all of these big box stores showing weakness for days so far the biggest winner of the day is ambev the ticker a b e v in the beer names closing over five percent gains for the day what's going on with reits muted picture mostly in the red we see the weakness in public storage continues and the bulk of the weakness in rates today for residential reits moving on to utilities one of the weakest sectors of the market so far and today the picture was not different we see declines even though modest ones for the biggest names here with the biggest loser pg and e pcg the ticker down about three percent or so for the day what's going on with materials gold miners closing in the red once again but we did see rebound in copper you see names like freeport mcmoran gaining over one and a half percent for the day and the strength in the name valley the ticker v-a-l-e brazilian miner the strength continues closing over five and a half percent for the day it's a no surprise that this name is catching a bit because the weakness in the u.s dollar and the rebound in copper prices iron prices are helping this particular name what about the energy sector the winner of the day we see massive gains for chevron over three percent exxon mobile almost three percent british petroleum over two percent phillips over three percent occidental almost 10 percent gains for the day kinder morgan over one percent and you start to see that these oil and gas names continue to catch a bid and for now any weakness is an opportunity to buy until and unless we see some bad news that put a hold to the rally what would that be fallout and stimulus that'll do it any bad vaccine news that'll do it and of course in the long term 
if the run in energy continues, we will face the same obstacle that was going on pre-COVID-19, the excess supply. Until unless the excess supply is removed out of the market, you will see the run in energy hitting a wall. Moving on to industrials, one of the weakest sectors of the day. The notable winner here is Boeing and the airline's names. You see Southwest closing about 2% in the green, United Airlines over 3%, American Airlines almost 5% in the green. But the weakness here in the giant industrial names, we see Eaton down over 2%. 3M down, all the railroad names down, and we see UPS, the weakness in UPS continues, down about 3% or so, but again, the bulk of the losses are from defense contractors. We see Lockheed Martin down over 1.5%, Northrop Grumman, Summer Story, down over 1.5%, and the biggest loser here is General Dynamics, down about 2.5% for the day. What's going on in healthcare? You see the gambling on Pfizer, yet Pfizer is not responding, pretty much muted for the day. But the run in Eli Lilly continues for another day. Eli Lilly closing about 2% in the green. Red day for healthcare plans, United Health, Humana, Cigna, Blue Shield, all closing in the red. And we see weakness in CVS here closing almost 2% in the downside. What about the biotech sector? Right away, we check on Moderna. Moderna is muted for the day, down about half a percent or so. But we do see the bulk of the losses here for Regeneron down about 2% or so. What's working in healthcare? Diagnostics, the rebounding. Thermo Fisher closing over 1.5% for the day. Illumina almost 2%. And Dexcom, the biggest winner closing over 4% in the green. What's going on here in financials? And this is very important to pay attention to. We're starting to see weakness here in some of the most important names. Specifically for regional banks, we see Lloyd Banking down over 4% for the day. The ticker LYG, and we see UBS closing 2% in the red. However, the biggest gainer for the day is Citibank closing over 2.5% in the green. What's going on with credit services? MasterCard down, Visa down, Amex muted. However, we see a rebound day for PayPal along with all the names that got faded yesterday. Moving on to the rotation trade. Any theme here? We have not been seeing any particular theme since the beginning of December. Since the beginning of the month, it's been a picker's market. Picking certain names, pushing them higher. Meanwhile, fading certain names and driving those names lower. What do we see here for the day? In the momentum names, rebound for Shopify, Tesla, PayPal, Zoom, DocuSign, but the biggest winner here is Peloton over 6.5% for the day. All in all, green picture for the momentum names. What's going on across the aisle? For the comeback stocks, the reopening names, the biggest winner, Chevron, MGM Grand, and we see Live Nation closing almost 3% for the day. The laggards in the comeback stocks, the reopening names, cruises, we see Royal Caribbean down over 2%, Alta Beauty, the weakness continue here after earnings, and we see General Motors down, the biggest loser by far, down over 3.5%. Moving on to the charts analysis and let's see what's going on here. Starting with the SPY, 15 minutes chart, what do we see here? We open gapping lower, but rest assured, the Robin Hoodiets went Naruto style, heads first, buying, asking questions later. Matter of fact, don't ask questions whatsoever. Just buy the dip and that is it. However, the bulk of the buying was computerized in the morning, meaning that the algos did the job in picking the dip along with the Robin Hoodiets. But all in all, the SPY closing week here, pretty much flat from the closing of yesterday. We don't see any definitive rebound erasing the declines from yesterday. Not yet at least, but catching support from the level of 364. And what do we see here? We see the beginning of formation of a bear flag, which should lead us further down in the days or weeks to come, depending how long this bear flag will take to formulate. However, the bulls have something on their side. They'll say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. Hold your horses. What bear flag? What are you talking about? Go back to December 2nd. We saw the same formation, a decline, and the so-called bear flag. But what happened? Nothing happened. We continued to march higher. And this one will be similar to that formation. You think it's a bear flag, but it is a bear trap, and we will continue to march higher. To answer the question of the difference between the bear flag formation that we're seeing right now versus December 2nd, we have to zoom out to the daily chart. 
The reversal from yesterday got registered in the daily chart. You see the big red candle down. In December 2nd, you can't even see the decline or the reversal. It wasn't even registered in the daily chart. This is what is keeping the bears hopeful that we have a short term top for now in the markets. But remember, yesterday we said hold your horses don't make any assumptions because yes it is a reversal candle however we did not even pierce the first level of support of 364 we did not do this even today so it's still too early very early to assume that this is a reversal that will lead us way lower very early and it is also too early to say that we found the bottom we bought the dim but we're going to continue to march higher from there on the top of the reversal candle the red candle that you see right on the chart that would be the goal for the dip buyers to reach and if they defeat the upper limit of that candle closing above it for the day then there you go you have the reversal to the upside the reversal of the reversal and we're going to continue to march higher from that point on however piercing the level of 364 closing below it that would go in the bear's camp saying and look we registered a very solid reversal signal here and we're not gonna do the v-shape recovery right away and the dip buyers will find themselves holding the bag moving on to the cues what do we see here 15 minutes chart right away gapping lower but catching support from which level the support level of 299 climbing higher facing resistance from which level 303.35 or thereof these levels have been pre-identified for days now these are not new lines that they just drew on the chart they've been there and you see that they work perfectly holding the cues in range today all in all the cues remain weak they did not climb all the way to challenge the reversal from yesterday they're still weak they're just showing a rebound for now how do you know from a daily chart perspective if this rebound has merit to reverse the red reversal candle from yesterday for the cues to continue to march higher you have to look for the daily closing above the resistance level of 303.35 in or around that range closing above it means that dip buyers have the momentum on their side as a bear how would you know if you are vindicated and the cues will show further weakness closing below the level of 299 from a daily perspective moving on to the iwm and this is a different chart from the spy and the cues why because the so-called reversal from yesterday did not even register in the iwm the strength continues in small caps and all in all we did not do anything yesterday when it comes to the iwm however we remain extended from an RSI perspective, from a MACD perspective, from a Bolger Bands perspective, meaning that the rally is on its last ride. And the only way for the rally to continue in a healthy manner is to consolidate for at least a couple of weeks and then resuming the rally higher. Other than that, all what they're going to do is pushing the IWM higher, paving the way for a steeper, harsher correction. Moving on to the dollar index, what do we see here? We've been waiting and anticipating a definitive crossing in the MACD indicator. We did not get that today. So the question is, was that all the raise for the US dollar? Just catching a footing here before resuming the declines lower? It's too early for that. I still think there is a push higher for the dollar index here. But remember, it is all dependent on the outcome of Brexit talks and the stimulus talks here in the United States. Did the decline in the US dollar today help gold? Not really. Gold remains muted, closing in the red, or excuse me, in the green, just slightly. We're talking about gold futures here. We're not talking about the ETF. And the challenge remains the level of 1870. We reversed from that point, but we're not going to be bullish again in gold until we close above the level of 1870. Moving on to the VIX. What do we see? Another green day for the VIX. However, muted. We didn't see a massive pop yet, but the VIX continues to grind higher and higher every day, indicating that at least we're starting to build some appetite for buying puts. If this continues, you will see a pop higher in the VIX. You have to watch the levels that I just gave you for the indices closing below them. You combine that if you see a pop in the VIX, and that would be your sign and signal that we're about to see a harsher 
reversal. Moving on to yields, the TNX, what do we see here? Declining today, however, still in range, still waiting, gathering energy, and waiting for what? The outcome of stimulus. The level of 1% remains a very important psychological level. It will act like a magnet. Once we hit 1%, you'll hear it in the news. Everybody's going to talk about 1%. And the rise in yields, banks are going to do very well. However, my take is we could see a panic selling specifically in the tech and momentum names. And remember, we've been talking about what will spark the next correction. We know the correction is coming. It is looming large, 10 to 20% correction. The question is, what will spark the correction? We talked about the scenario of a short squeeze in the dollar index. We talked about the scenario of a fallout in stimulus talks. We talked about the scenario of a fallout in the Brexit talks. We talked about the scenario that the IPOs could trigger the sell-off. If we see a massive decline in DoorDash and Airbnb tomorrow and next week, that could trigger a correction in the overall market. But here we have the scenario. What if we reach 1% and the market decides to panic? 1% is still a very small number in terms of yields but remember the markets look forward and if this is the forward trajectory for yields that we're going to continue to march higher and higher from here that would freak out the market specifically the growth and momentum section of the market why is that because the majority of these companies specifically the smaller growth names are pretty much built on debt higher yields higher interest rates means that these companies will have a harder time to service their debts and they will have higher expenses due to interest payments and that will shrink their margins, their revenues and profitability. Moving on to bonds, the TLT, what's going on here? Here is a weekly chart and we are still trading in range of last week's candle but we are picking up some steam here. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting when are we gonna see an appetite to shift some money to the safety of bonds at least on temporary basis we haven't seen that yet however once again everything is dependent on the outcome of the stimulus stocks you're not going to see a reversal in the stock market meaning a correction overall for the entire indices not just the rotation or anything like that a correction you're not going to see it until and unless you see a surge higher in bond prices meaning an appetite to shift some money from equities to bonds and weakness in Apple. Remember the three conditions. We need to see a reversal and weakness in Apple because Apple is the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ is Apple. Furthermore, we need to see a pop higher in the VIX closing above the level of 25. But speaking of Apple, here we go. 15 minutes chart. We caught support from the level of 120. The low of the day was around 120.17 we caught a bid from that point on marching higher closing between the range of 120 and 125 120 support 125 is resistance apple is in no man's land right now we have to wait and see for tomorrow's activities if apple will gather more energy more momentum to give another crack at the level of 125 moving on to tesla what do we see tesla's acting just like the rest of the market rebounding not closing above the reversal candle from yesterday but about half of the range and closing most importantly above the important level of 599 remember that tesla has more room to run here from an rsi perspective the name could go all the way to 700 bucks if it wants to if it can gather the momentum and the energy it can go all the way to 700 bucks there is still more room for Tesla to go. But the question is, was the reversal candle from Wednesday it? Meaning the top, the short term top for now. Are we going to go and visit my target at the trend line in yellow? The answer for that will probably come as soon as tomorrow. So it is a very important day to watch for Tesla shares. And remember, quadruple witching coming up. Next week, expiration date, December 18th. Lots of funny activities are going to take place next week because option sellers have accumulated a massive amount of Tesla shares. Now, the majority of the calls they sold are now in the money, meaning that come up next week, they're going to have to sell their Tesla shares, missing a lot of the profits because they have to sell at the strike price of the calls they sold. They'd rather sell at the 600 levels instead of 550. So if you're reading the tape 
in the psychology right, they're likely to dump at these levels to lock in some profits and make sure that the bulk of the calls they sold for Tesla will expire worthless. The trick is that they don't do it too soon, meaning say tomorrow and then we see declines Monday, Tuesday next week. And what do you know? Option traders push Tesla even higher and now option sellers are in trouble. So they're going to time it right, but they will dump this name before Friday's expiration next week, December 18th. You bet. And here is the last chart of the day for the XRT. We've been following this particular ETF for a couple of days now. And I'm highlighting to you the reversal in the daily MACD. Last time we saw a reversal in the daily MACD crossing to the negative territory, creating red impressions in the histogram. It didn't look from the daily chart of the XRT that we are heading for a reversal. We had some red candles, but we've been trading flattish for a few days before you saw the flush down and the correction of about 10% or so. Are we seeing the same thing right now? We have a successful crossing in the MACD to the negative territory, creating red impressions in the histogram, yet the chart is pretty much trading in range, flattish, looking bullish if you're just looking at the chart itself. So are we going to see that flush down coming up very soon of about 10% or so? That is at least my take and my expectations for now. And remember, we do have the retail sales data coming out next week. If those come out disappointing, you bet that we will see the 10% correction happening next week. And now let's move on to conclude this video with viewers questions and answers and here is the question. In summary, the viewer is asking what is the date of the crash? When will the market crash? Well, if I did know, you think I'll be talking to you right now or would I be busy in a bunker being the richest man on the planet? I have no clue. However, if I want to channel my inner Tom Lee, I would say the correction will take place in February. The reason is, historically speaking, February is the weakest month in the stock market. Furthermore, the market has layers of protection. What do I mean by that? The layers of protection are the reasons why the dip buying crowd is buying every single dip, pushing the indices higher, preventing the correction. Here are the layers. Number one, vaccine optimism. We are pretty much through with the vaccine optimism. We have another pump coming perhaps tomorrow. If the FDA approves the Pfizer vaccine by granting an emergency use authorization, that could give a pump to the market, specifically Pfizer shares. However, my impression is that the bulk of vaccine optimism is already priced in. So we're through, we're done with that one particular layer of protection. What do we have next? Stimulus optimism. That is what's been keeping us on edge buying every dip because we're assuming that we're going to have a stimulus. Now, what happens if we have a mini stimulus in December that does not include 1200 bucks checks to the people? The market might throw a fit, but it will still trade in hopeful optimism that we will have a bigger stimulus bill next year. What would determine the outcome, whether we're going to have a bigger stimulus bill next week or not, excuse me, next year or not, is point number three, layer number three, the split government optimism. In January, we have the elections in Georgia, and we will know right away whether the Democrats are going to hold the majority in the Senate or not, meaning whether they're going to be able to pass another round of stimulus or not. Because if we have a mini bill, and by many, by the way, I'm talking about 900 billion bucks passing in December this month. If McConnell holds the majority in the Senate, he will not pave any way for another stimulus bill, period. Meaning that the outcome of the elections in Georgia is critical. If the Republicans hold the majority of the Senate, that means no stimulus. And now we're paving the way for the big correction in the stock market in February. Because layer number four is the weak dollar optimism. And that is pretty much priced in. You see the massive short interest in the US dollar. And we've already seen sectors like energy and materials, industrials already rallying significantly in most cases overdoing the rally. Now the last layer of protection which has been there since the financial crisis, but more so right now, is the cocaine optimism, aka the Fed put. But remember, the Fed is not going to prevent any correction. That is not their job. 
Their job is to rescue the market if there is a panic, meaning that we could drop down 10%, 20%, even 30% in a rapid manner. And then the Fed will interfere to put an end for the decline. Now, whether the market is going to bounce back in a V-shaped recovery right away, that remains doubtful. Meaning that if you continue to buy, buy, buy right now, like Justin Timberlake, Assuming that even if there is a massive correction, the Fed is going to rescue us and we're going to bounce right back in a V-shaped recovery, you might be mistaken here. We could decline in February 10, 20, 30 percent and the Fed puts an end to the decline, but the Fed isn't going to overdo it by pushing the market higher once again in a V-shaped recovery. Because guess what? If we decline from the top 10, 20, even 30 percent, we are way above the marsh bottom. So the Fed has the incentive of putting an end to the bleeding, but not propping the market higher once again. That remains on the hand of market participants to pick up the scraps and build another rally from that point on. It's too early to say, but this is my outlook for now. And that's all I got for you today. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Ask them in the comments, my Twitter page, do whatever. You got to do, and I'll do my best to answer every single one of them. Thank you for watching. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.